And we just thank you that you've gathered us here for that purpose this morning. We ask that you would use uh, your word to change our hearts this morning and to uh, bring us more in line with your purposes for our life and for our children. We ask that you would do this work in the name of your son. Amen. Thank you, guys. Good morning. You're back. I always wonder if you're going to come back. It's good to see all of you. I am not checking my text messages. I got to stay with um, Joe and Tina Flayhive last night. And as I want to do when I stay in other people's homes, I go through their library. And um, I love books. And in Joe's library is a book called Raising Boys. Obviously, I was interested. So I, uh, I pulled the book open, and um, on the first couple pages was... A, um, a letter from a, a, a young lady to the author, and she wrote a letter to him saying, why girls are more better than boys. And there's a list of, uh, I think there was 40 of them. I, only, I took a picture of it, so I only got about 25 of them, but I thought you'd get a kick out of this as a um, trailer from uh, last night, why girls are more better than boys. Girls sing better, they're more talented, they can do their hair better, they cover their mouths when they sneeze, they don't pick their nose. Uh, they go to the bathroom politely. Uh, they, girls learn faster. Girls are more kinder to animals. Girls don't smell as bad. Girls are more smarter. I think this was like a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old girl. So, uh, And some of these I'm skipping because probably not good and polite company. Uh, girls are more quieter. Um, girls don't get as dirty. Uh, girls are more attractive, amen, men? Yeah. Uh, girls don't eat as much, and uh, it just goes on and on. It's pretty funny. Well, but then I turned the page, and he had published this list somehow, and a little boy didn't like that list. So he wrote a letter saying why boys are more better than girls. And he says, uh, um, boys can, front, can sit in front of a scary movie and not close their eyes once. Um, they don't get embarrassed easily. Boys can go to the bathroom in the woods. Um, boys can climb trees better. Boys can hang on to their stomachs on fast rides. I don't know. That one was curious to me. Boys don't worry about diet this and diet that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, boys can build better forts than girls. Boys can take pain better than girls. I disagree. I watched my wife go through labor three times. Um, I've always said that if it was up to men, we would all have one baby. We might do it once, but would we ever go back a second time? I don't think so. You ladies are amazing. Uh, boys have less fits. Boys don't waste their life at the mall. Um, boys aren't afraid of reptiles. Boys don't braid each other's hair. Uh, boys aren't smart, Alex. There's another one I don't know that I agree with. Boys don't cry and feel sorry when they kill a fly. So, you know, it's, it's sad. The writer of that book would be disappointed to know that's as far as I got in the book. Um, and I shared that with you. By the way, it was uh, by James Dobson. I think it's called Raising Boys, a book that I've never read. And I've read a lot of books by James Dobson. I just didn't even know that one was there. So, yeah, so we're going to talk about boys today. Um, and I love talking about boys because um, God designed young men to have a place in this world um, and uniquely laid down to, next to the roles of a woman, it works beautifully, um, which is why it is amazing that in our culture and in our fallen state, and I'm not saying that as they, I'm saying us, that every day, unfortunately, we reject God's perfect design, um, and that's part of living in a fallen world, and so last night and today really is an opportunity to be reminded of this is what God's called us to do and be, and this isn't um, about making you feel bad or burdened today. I hope you walked out last night more encouraged and challenged than discouraged. It's easy to hear all of this and say, oh my goodness, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this, and that's good, but please be encouraged that you are doing many things right. I want you to be excited. I want you to see those little boys that God has given you as the opportunity to produce men 
in a culture that is desperate for real men, as the Bible defines real men, not as Hollywood defines it. And the task in front of you is going to be a lot of work. Um, I also want to remind you it should be a lot of fun. Um, You should be having fun in all of this. I always enjoyed parent. Well, I shouldn't say that. That's, that would not be true. I didn't always enjoy it. There were days. Aren't there days? It's not a lot of fun. But in the grand scheme of things, I loved it. Um, and I think you should love it. It's a gift from the Lord, um, the role that you've been given. God has delegated enormous authority to everybody in this room this morning. Um, and He's equipped you to do the task. So the foundation for understanding the goals of parenting is to understand, again, what the end product should look like. I'm taking the same approach this morning that I took last night, which is let's understand what the product should look like, and then I want to walk back to, from Scripture, look at some of the disciplines um, and habits to train into our sons, Um, and then as there's time, I'll run back through those and give some practical observations. Again, all of that is designed to not be the end of the discussion, um, but to start a discussion in your home. If mom and dad can be on the same page, first of all, with what the goal is, then it's much easier to get mom and dad on the same page in terms of the day-to-day parenting decisions and even the broad stroke decisions that are made in terms of what is, what is our house going to look like. Um, and I, as you, I think you saw last night, I'm not spending a lot of time on methodology because the Bible doesn't talk a lot about methodology. And I think that that, uh, as a young parent, frustrated me. I wanted the checklist from God on how to do this. It's not there. What is there is the checklist from God on what I'm supposed to produce. And in hindsight, I understand the wisdom of, of God in that every child is uniquely different, and so there can never be one list. And so... Um, a a checklist for daughter number one wouldn't have worked with daughter number two in my family, definitely true, Um, completely different, okay? So the starting point of all of this is to challenge you folks in the room, mom and dad, as we begin to talk about your sons, are you an example to your sons? Um, If if you're living it, they're going to learn it. If you're saying it and living something else, they have, you've now given them a multiple choice exam, and they get to pick. I'm going to do what mom and dad say, or I'm going to do what mom and dad do. Um, and I think as much as possible, you want to avoid the multiple choice exam, or the multiple choices. Do your sons understand that they want to be a man someday, as defined by the Bible? Do they know what that looks like? Do your daughters understand that they want to marry a man someday? Now, obviously, if your daughter's four years old, you probably don't want to go down that road. So much of what I say, and I just want to say this, please take what I'm saying with wisdom and discernment that some of what I'm telling you is down the road, but it's good to think about it today. Um, But eventually, to begin the conversation with your daughters that they want to be married to a biblical man someday, do they know what that looks like, dads? This is the part that... Eric is saying this get, might get a little uncomfortable. Moms, do your children know that you honor your husband and his role? Um, do you praise and honor as you can the qualities and character of your husband? When I say as you can, you don't want to flatter. Um, your husband is, um, don't be offended, men. I think you would all probably agree with this. They're flawed. And so nobody's living this in perfection. But in, in the context of that, do you acknowledge the qualities and character of your husband? And then ultimately, for both of you, the question today is, do you agree on the goal for your son? If, if you can walk away from this process agreeing on that um, and agreeing on the importance of attaining that goal, that will create all kinds of clearer conversations as you evaluate your sons and and your parenting. You know, our our culture, I started with this last night with the girls, I'm going to do the same with the boys um, and make observations that you already know. In our culture, dads are dummies. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I know a lot of people who write in Hollywood because of where I live, and the formula in Hollywood is that dads are dumb. 
helpless, dependent, um, and that formula is written into television shows, movies, all of our culture is bombarded with that. Mom's in charge, she's smart, mature, capable, amen to that, but that is the overwhelming message, and boys are being bombarded in our culture with dads are kind of off to the side. They're not central to what really matters in the home. Um, we live in a Peter, what I call a Peter Pan culture. We are pressing very hard to not let our sons um, grow up. Uh, we want to protect them from the vagaries of life as long as possible. Um, there was a, a, a the, what was called Obamacare passed 10 years ago. Whatever you think of that, probably the most significant cultural impact of that legislation was codifying in federal law that childhood lasts through the age of 26. That is amazing. Um, uh, people in this country 35, 40 years ago never would have believed that. And there's a, a big, and, and I'm not being political today, but I just want to say one more thing. It, it's the culture that your sons are growing up in. We are in a culture now that is pushing hard for government to provide for families rather than the man to provide for a family. The man is being replaced. Boys are growing up with no convictions about anything. They want to let the women lead. In fact, they're being told to let the women lead. Um, immense pride is exalted. There's the degradation of women. Um, pornography has become commonplace. It's everywhere, and it wouldn't be if there wasn't a market for it. And men are feeding that. Little boys who grow up into men who have a demand for that product. It's everywhere. And children and boys are expected to go through a period of adolescence. Adolescence is a relatively recent phenomenon. And I say that because the average age in Yale in the 1800s, the average age in Yale, that's not the starting age, but the average age of the young man in Yale was 13 years old. And Benjamin Franklin, if you know anything about him, was sent out of his family to apprentice full-time away from the home at the age of 13. I, I can't imagine if I pulled you moms aside and said, what do you think about your little boy leaving the home when he's 13? It's completely foreign, right? It'd be hard. That was life back in the 17 and 1800s. Adolescence did not exist in the 1800s. Um, life expectancy was about 45 years, so there was an urgency to get out there and get it done. Today, there is no such urgency. And let me define ad adolescence. Adolescence came in um, in, um, well, it was, a, it was labor law, basically, because there was abuses of children who were involved in labor um, uh, inappropriately, and so they codified in the law that you could not have children below a certain age, and what the net result of that was is there's a period of childhood, and there's a period of adulthood, and now there's this parentheses in the middle. And this parentheses in the middle generally starts in the teen years, and now culturally extends, well, by law to 26, and I'm seeing in our church and in our area of the country that there's men in their 30s that still haven't decided to be a man. And they're in adolescence. They're in this parentheses where it's a dead period. They're not a child. They're not an adult. Um, there's no expectations, no responsibilities, no failure, no pain, no discipline. It's an open-ended, multiple choice of when is my childhood going to end. And everyone decides for themselves. And the goal here today is for you to think about when that's going to end um, for your sons. I have a very good friend back at Grace Church who started telling his boys when they were very young that when you go off to college, you're never coming back. And you say, wow, that's harsh. Um, that might sound harsh, but when you start saying that to an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old, by the time they go off to college, they don't even want to come back. And the wisdom of that is, you're a man. Be a man. And all of the parenting of this man and his wife was driven towards that's the finish line. That's when we're done. So, and I'm not telling you you have to do that. I'm giving you that as something to think about. You contrast today's standard for manhood with a previous generation's 
standard for manhood. And one of the ways um, that I do that is I went and looked at all of the Congressional Medal of Honor. I don't know if you know what that is. I'm sure you have some idea. These are uh, medals for valor that are given to folks in the military. And I found three that were given posthumously to 18-year-olds. George Watson, for extraordinary heroism in action. I'm reading the actual citations. For extraordinary heroism in action on 8 March 1943, Private Watson was on board a ship which was attacked and hit by enemy bombers. When the ship was abandoned, Private Watson, instead of seeking to save himself, remained in the water assisting several soldiers who could not swim to reach the safety of the raft. This heroic action, which subsequently cost him his life, resulted in the saving of several of his comrades. Weakened by his exertions, he was dragged down by the suction of the sinking ship and was drowned. 18 years old. Junior Van Noy, 17 October 1943, when wounded late in September, Private Van Noy declined evacuation and continued on duty. On 17 October 1943, he was a gunner in charge of a machine gun post only five yards from the water's edge when the alarm was given that three enemy barges loaded with troops were approaching the beach in the early morning darkness. One landing barge was sunk by Allied fire, but the other two reached the beach 10 yards from Private Van Noy's emplacement. Despite his exposed position, he poured a withering hail of fire into the debarking enemy troops. His loader next to him was wounded by a grenade and evacuated. Private Van Noy, also grievously wounded by that same grenade, remained at his post, ignoring calls of nearby soldiers, urging him to withdraw and continued to fire with deadly accuracy. He expended every round and was found covered with wounds, dead beside his gun. 18 years old. John Towell, one more, 82nd Airborne near Ooster, Holland, 21 September 1944. Private Towell served as a rocket launcher gunner and was occupying a defensive position in the west sector of the recently established Nijmegen Bridgehead when a strong enemy force of approximately 100 infantry supported by two tanks and a half-track formed for a counterattack. With full knowledge of the disastrous consequences resulting not only to his company but to the entire bridgehead by an enemy breakthrough, Private Tal immediately and without orders left his foxhole and moved 200 yards in the face of intense small arms fire to a position on an exposed dike roadbed. I'm not going to read the whole thing. There's a blockbuster movie made of the next paragraph. 18-year-old Private Tal was mortally wounded by a mortar shell. By his heroic tenacity at the price of his life, Private Tal saved the lives of many of his comrades and was directly instrumental in breaking up the enemy counterattack. One of the key battles turned on an 18-year-old. These men, some certainly today would call them boys, demonstrated at a very young age an understanding of the significant elements of true manhood. And I'm not talking about the ability to shoot a gun or serve in the military or be recognized for their bravery. That's not the element of manhood that's on display with these three men. I'm talking about their legacy of service, humility, commitment, obedience, chivalry, giving their life at the, to save others' lives and their leadership. And each of them was honored posthumously for this sacrifice, and I think I've been able to find out that two of those three snuck in. They lied to get into the army because they were too young. You, con you contrast that with the version of manhood that, or what passes for manhood in our culture of no responsibility, no concept of hard physical labor, sweating labor, um, no goals, no need, no desperation, no mental connection between effort and survival. No commitment to anyone or anything except their own pleasure. Most young men today, it's my observation in the part of the world I live in, most young men today wouldn't die for anything. And the hard thing to say is most of their moms wouldn't even let them. So let's look at the biblical picture of manhood. Just like last night, 
I want to say this. This session is not how to raise Christian sons. This is a session on raising biblical men, men who live in accordance with the design of the Creator. In other words, um, men who, if they live according to this design, whether they name the name of Christ or not, will live a blessed life by God's design. Even if they reject the gospel, they know that they are living as their creator designed them to live. You can't impose your desire, your wish, your passion that your kids are saved. You pray for your kids' salvation. You teach them the gospel. You teach them the fear of God. You teach them wisdom from above. You teach them obedience to to you so that they understand that they are, are to obey the authority in their life, including God. And once you've done that, you have completed the task as it relates to their salvation. You cannot take it any further. But you can and you must teach and train them um, to be the man that, that their creator designed them to be. And I took the same approach in this study years ago um, as with the girls. Men, why are we here on this earth as men and not ladies? And there is a difference there is a significant difference. Our culture will, is continuing to bombard us that there should be no difference. They can say it till they're blue in the face. It will not change that by God's creation, men are different than women. How they look, how they act, and why we are here on this earth. So, let me give you the three right up front, and then I'm going to show you from uh, the Bible where we get these. But the three unique roles of a man as unique from a woman, and again, not, a, not in total, not exclusively, but the three descriptions in all of the Bible of what a man is to do that you never see for a woman is that the man is to be the primary provider for his family. He is to be the leader of his wife and home. And he is to be the protector of his wife and home. Okay? Provider, leader, and protector. So let's look at provider. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to start back in the creation account again, and this will fill in some of the blanks from last night because we skipped over some of the uh, creation account last night. We're going to look at it now from the perspective of the creation of the man. In Genesis 2, we find out the purpose of man. This is the description of the creation, and in verse 5 it says, Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to what? To work, to cultivate the ground. Whatever version of the Bible you're looking at, it says something to that nature. There, in other words, there was nothing green on the earth for two reasons, no rain, no man. Okay, you can read the next couple of verses that the rain, the moisture comes, and God creates man. And then in verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to enjoy it. Is that what it says? No, to cultivate it and keep it. He was put into the garden, he was created to work. This role, by the way, is pre-curse. Men, work is not a curse. It is not the curse. Let's find out what the curse is. If you turn over to Genesis chapter 3 in verse 17, this is after sin has happened, and God is pronouncing the curse on Satan, on the man and the woman. In verse 17, he says to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread. The curse made one difference. Work was not the curse. Food the role of man did not change because of sin. What happened is the purpose of work did change. 
Work before, the, before sin was pure pleasure. Now work is going to be required for survival, for provision. Okay? Pre-curse, food was provided. Post-curse, food is a result of labor. So the purpose of work changed. Work was not the curse. It's all the sweat, the blood, the tears, the trials, the tribulations at work, the difficulty sometimes of finding work, the difficulty of enjoying your work, dealing with all the politics at the office, whatever the challenges are, that is all part of the curse. Okay? All of that to provide for his wife and his children. Second role, leader, the husband and father role, which matches up really close with the wife and mom role. Genesis 2, I mentioned last night that Adam was incomplete. This was not an oops. It wasn't an oversight by God. It was, um, the, it was a designed hole that could only be filled by a woman, a loving and wise creator in his perfect time and in his perfect way filled that hole. And I want to show you that story. If you turn back now to Genesis chapter 2, I love this story. Um, if you look at verse 20, the man gave names to all the cattle and the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. Do you, you've heard that story before? If you've been in the church all your life, you heard that story in, in uh, Sunday school. How did all the animals get their names? Well, it tells us right there in Genesis 2. The context of this story is what's fascinating to me. We start back up in verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. We spent quite a bit of time on that last night. So, verse 19, out of the ground, the Lord God formed a wife. Is that what it says? No. He says it's not good for men to be alone alone. I'm going to make him a helper. And then immediately out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the sky, and to the beasts of the field. Why is that the sequence? Because the next phrase, but for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. You know, the purpose of Adam of God creating the animals and Adam naming all the animals was not to name the animals. The purpose was in God, I think it's a bit of a sense of humor, I don't think I'm being disrespectful when I say that, but I think it's God making Adam see that there's two of everything and none of them are like me. I'm lonely. He is showing Adam, he's showing the human race that man is incomplete. And he took Adam through this process, and you think Adam didn't understand that there's not a helper suitable for him? He clearly did. It's stated there in Genesis 2.20, now verse 21, so then the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man for this reason. There's the full context now. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Man was alone and incomplete. He needed a completer, a helper. God allows him to name all the animals, see his need, and then fill the need. Amazing. Man needs help, and he needs to be completed, and God created woman, and man is told to leave his father and mother to be complete. Your little boy was created, and unless he's a, uh, unless he's a very rare exception, he was created to be married and to lead a woman. That might be hard for you to understand when you look at your sweet little boy, but he's leaving you someday. So, what was the curse on Adam? Understanding that begins to explain how he failed, and we talked about this last night, but in chapter 3, Genesis 3, verse 17, he says to Adam, I just read it, because you've listened to the voice of your wife. You stepped out of your leadership role, 
And by defining that sin, God highlights his role. He is to be the leader. If you read the account in the first several verses of Genesis 3 of the original sin, you can play a game. You've heard of the game, Where's Waldo? You can play a game in the first several verses of Genesis 3 and say, Where's Adam? Adam's not even mentioned until, I think it's verse 6. That is a picture of what happened in the garden. Adam stepped back and let Eve lead. And by highlighting that, God is defining this is the perfect design that the man is to step up and to lead. Okay? And then as we saw last night, verse 16 of Genesis 3, when he's talking to Eve, he says, your desire will be for your husband. Men, leadership is still your role. Leadership is not the curse. The curse on leadership is, man, we want to wimp out. We do want to step back and let somebody else do it. And God married us to a woman who is more than willing to step in and do it. And she's probably in many cases more capable, more articulate. Amen? Okay. More talented. Yeah, we could go on all morning. Let's just move on. (laughs) In the home, in the church, in the marriage relationship, the role of a leader is established before the fall of man. The curse did not cause this role to be established. This was God's design in His perfect architecture of a man and a woman living together for life in God's creation that the man would lead. Leadership, men, is not the punishment. Sometimes we want to think that, don't we? Why do I have to do this? Why did Adam sin? I don't want to lead. Leadership is not a skill. It's not a goal. It's it's not a giftedness. It is a fact of life. Your little boy will someday have a wife and children of his own with some exception. We talked about that last night. 1 Corinthians 7 clearly makes room for those who are called to singleness. That is extremely rare. Your little guy is going to be married. Your little boy someday will have children of his own. And so a young man, your son that says to you, I'm not a leader, is terribly, terribly wrong. Every male is a leader. That is one of the distinguishing differences between why God created a man as opposed or different than a woman. God's design for your little boy is to lead. And if you understand that, if you see that, then, and you can agree on that as mom and dad, doesn't that change your parenting? I'm not just producing a son. I'm not just producing a man. I'm producing a leader. It gives some urgency to what you're, you are to do. He must be urged to become a leader. He must be given opportunity to be a leader. You must put him in situations where he can demonstrate his leadership so that, yes, he can fail and learn, but also so that he can gain confidence that he is a leader so that at some point he can lead. So, provider, leader, let's talk about protector. Genesis 3, again, the curse defined Adam's sin as abandoning his role as leader. And when you play where's Adam in Genesis chapter 3, the first several verses, he clearly could have stepped in at any time and said, no, we're not going to do that, and protected Eve. He did not do that. In Ephesians 5, just to put a New Testament, um, I don't want to say spin, just let me back up. The New Testament version of Genesis 2 and 3 is in Ephesians 5. Man, I know you know this passage. If you don't, you should. It's, it's thoroughly humiliating, humbling. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. This is describing the love of a husband for his wife. And I want you to hear it through the grid of protection that the husband might sanctify his wife. What does that mean? That means to protect her from sin, from sinful behavior, from sinful influences, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word. Leadership in the home is protecting your family 
by wa the washing of the water with the word of God, that he might present to himself in all the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. That is the failure of Adam. That is the failure of Chris Hamilton. That is the failure of every man in this room to some degree. This is the protection. This is the role of a man in the husband-wife relationships. Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body. For this reason, sound familiar? A man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So when you see in Genesis 2 that for this reason a man leaves his father and mother, add one more thing, to do everything it describes in Ephesians 5. It's not just to provide for her, it's not just to lead her, but it is to protect her and to present her in all her glory. Sanctified, no spot or wrinkle or any such thing goes on to say this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. It says to us men, by the way, this isn't a marriage seminar, but I have to say this, four times that we are to love our wives. I always see that as a recognition by Paul that guys are a little thick. We've got to hear it four times. Part of protection is a reflection of our love for our wife. And they, he throws in at the end, wives, respect your husband. He only has to say it once to the wives because they're smarter than us. But four times, love your wife. Love your wife. This is what it looks like. Lead her, provide for her, protect her. There's physical protection and there's spiritual protection. Okay? So, provider, leader, protector. There's, there's enough there to give us a lifetime to work on in our own marriage. But what we're talking about now is producing young men from our homes who understand that they are called, because they're a man, that uniquely they are called to provide, to lead, and to protect. So I want to go through some disciplines or habits that do not come naturally. They will take work. They will require work on the part of your son. They will require work on your part to stay the course and burn these lessons in to the hearts of your son. None of what follows comes easily, which is why I picked uh, today there's six. Again, there could have been four and there could have been 16. Today, there's going to be six, six disciplines, and again, the idea here is to give you some things to think about. Um, this isn't all-inclusive, and in some ways, this is maybe just the starting point, but I want to give you moms and dads things to think about and talk about and pray about as you evaluate each son that you either have now or that the Lord brings to you. The first discipline is work, and the, the, this speaks to if your son is going to provide for his wife and children someday, then you need to discipline them in the area of work. You can't be a biblical man, meaning living according to God's design, if you're not fulfilling the most basic role of a man, which is to provide for his family. The natural bent of your son <clears throat> is laziness. It's all over Scripture. I don't mean to offend you. I'm sure your son might be the exception, but I can make a general statement that the natural bent of a, of a little boy is laziness. It takes discipline to love work, to self-start. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. You heard that verse? That is directly corollary, corollary to Genesis chapter 3. That is a practical reality. That, and that is work to provide needs, not work to obtain wealth. The Lord gives wealth to who he gives wealth, it says in the Bible. Wealth is not what we're talking about this morning. 
We're talking about the discipline of work to provide needs. Work, it, you know, and when you're teaching these disciplines, it's important to let your son know that work is not a curse. It's actually a good thing. I was telling a couple men yesterday, about a year and a half ago, I thought my career was over because of some medical things that happened. I thought I was going to be in the, in the uh, hospital bed in the living room for the rest of my life. That's where I was going. And it was a real wake-up call, a real reminder of what a gift work is. Some of you here may be struggling to find work, you, or you have struggled to find work. You know what it is, what a blessing work is. We can't forget that work is not a curse. It is a blessing. Our work is a gift from God for His glory and for our good and enjoyment. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, Anyone who does not provide for his own, especially those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever can't get much more blunt than that. Proverbs chapter 6. Love Proverbs. You've heard that. Proverbs 6. Remember, Proverbs is a son, uh, excuse me, a father speaking to his son in the first seven chapters. You know this passage. Go to the ant, O sluggard. I don't know if you remember or knew. That's a father calling his son a what? A sluggard. Whoa. Whoa. Go to the ant, son, O sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief, officer, or ruler, self-starter, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. Your son's natural bent is to be a sluggard. Your goal, your job as a parent to prepare them to work so that they can provide is to train them out of that natural bent, the habits and the disciplines of work. Second discipline is money. You can't lead and provide biblically if you can't distinguish between the command to provide for yourself and your family that I just read to you and the culture's demand that you have everything you could possibly want. See, you don't have to train into your sons the desire for money. What you want to do is to discipline them and their perspective of money. Or you want to train them out of the perspective that someone else is responsible for providing for them and their family. I'm an accountant, so I get asked to talk about money a lot. One of the studies I did is, what does the Bible say we're supposed to do with our money? There's so many books on money. I can't read them. They make me crazy. Um, The Bible is so simple, so complete. Here's what the Bible says we are to do with our money. And this is something, I throw this out to you because maybe this is good to train your sons. One is we're to provide for our family. We've already seen that. When you train your son in that, you're teaching him obedience to a command. A second use of money is we're supposed to pay what we owe. That's integrity. That is, when you buy a car and you sign a contract and you say, I'm going to pay this monthly payment until it's paid off, integrity says you pay it off. Third use of money in the Bible is you save for the future. Teaching our sons the discipline of saving for the future, that demonstrates self-control. That demonstrates that I don't use all my money today for today's needs. I have a long-term view. The fourth thing the Bible says you're supposed to do with your money is to pay taxes. That demonstrates a submission to authority. And the fifth thing the Bible says you're supposed to do with your money is to give it away. Give it away, and that demonstrates a generosity. So money is amoral. By itself, it has no moral characteristic. But it is a barometer of the character of the person who's holding that money. And I just went through the five uses. You may find other things in the Bible that you're supposed to use your money for. Let me know. I can't find them. It's pretty simple. Five things. And those five uses of money, again, if you view money as a barometer of character, they demonstrate how you use your money demonstrates character. 
Providing for your family demonstrates an obedience to God's design. Paying what you owe demonstrates an integrity. Saving for the future is self-control. Paying taxes is submission to authority. That hurts sometimes, doesn't it? And then giving it away demonstrates a generosity. So if you train your sons in the use of money, don't forget the moral aspects and the character aspects of the use of that money. And there's two disciplines in particular to consider when you're training your sons to be future providers. One is contentment. This is a subset of money. Contentment. 1 Timothy 6, 6 says, Godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. And it goes on to define that. If we've brought nothing into the world, we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. It says nothing about a new Ford F-150. It says nothing about a new ski boat. It doesn't say anything about vacations. None of that's bad. The definition of content in the Scripture is some place to live, food on the table, and clothing. That's a whole different definition of contentment than your son is going to be bombarded with in this culture. Teach your son biblical contentment. And then there's generosity. It's difficult to be disciplined for discipline giving to the church to coexist with a grasping materialism. And for a six-year-old little boy, this may not be a big issue, but six years old might be a great time to begin the discipline of obedience to 1 Corinthians 16, 2, which says... On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collection may be made when I come. Or, or 2 Corinthians 8, where it describes that people beg for the opportunity to participate in the ministry financially and the great blessing that comes from that. So it's not just an issue of obedience, but it's the discipline of understanding that giving to the church is an opportunity to participate in the ministry to see what God will do with my money which is actually his money. That's the discipline. You know, I was asked last night, you know, how do you teach handling money? And I, I gave an example of, you know, when they see something in the store um, and they want it and you say no, that will trigger in them, well, how do I get money? And you offer them opportunities um, to earn money. Another one is when they see you putting money in the plate every Sunday in obedience to the Lord, I've seen it in my own family, the little ones say, wait, I want to do that. Ah, you need money to do that. It's discipline, discipline, training, 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 discipleship, 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 lead by example. Your kids will ask the right questions. It will give you the opportunity to teach these disciplines. And the part of generosity is 1 John 3, 17, whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? It's not just putting money in the plate or giving it to the church. It's seeing people around you in need. And a, a, just picture your little boy becoming a man who cares about people that has less than he does. What a man. That's... That's an amazing uh, young man coming out of anybody's home. Number three, third discipline is purpose. A biblical man knows who he is and what he's about. Sounds Hollywood, doesn't it? It's biblical. Your young man should come out of your home able to articulate that this is who I am, this is what I do, this is why I do it. I will tell you as an employer, I see that in one out of 500. It should be 100% coming out of this room. Said another way, he knows who he is or who he will be. He knows he's going to be a provider, a leader, and a protector, and he acts accordingly, and his life is driven in that direction. He's not known as an idle or a lazy person, partly because he knows the discipline of work, but also because there's an urgency of purpose. An urgency of purpose. He knows he needs to get there. I love Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time. Because the days are evil, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
There is a blueprint. That verse alone, if your son understands that verse eventually and lives according to it, he's in the top 1% of our culture. It says, be careful, be wise, be strategic, be purposeful. It's all wrapped up in that verse. And right along behind um, the discipline of purpose is, is convictions. The discipline of convictions. The essence of biblical manhood is the merging of strength and courage. And this point, this point speaks to the biblical man who demonstrates the strength and courage of his convictions. You are teaching your son the fear of God, the wisdom of God, obedience to God. You're teaching him these disciplines, and you're producing a young man who has the strength and courage of his convictions, not his abilities, his convictions. You see, leadership can't exist without firm convictions. Some of you in the workplace work for people in management who should never be in management because they don't have answers to anything. Those who are convicted become leaders, effective leaders. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 is a verse you're probably familiar with. with. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. I used to play football, and then when I couldn't play football anymore, I coached football. And we used to bring in the motivational speakers before the game to get them all fired up. California football. I know it's different than Texas football. Um, and we used to have guys come in and quote this verse. And this verse is great because you get to define what act like men looks like however you want. And before a football game, it means you go take somebody's head off. Rawr, let's go. Have you heard that verse before? Act like men? Do you know that that verse was not written to men? That's part of a letter to the church at Corinth, and it was written to men, women, boys and girls, the church. And what the church is being told is, look at the men around you and act like them. Scary, isn't it, guys? That means we better be what? Acting like men. This verse summarizes manhood in every way. It says, be on the alert. There is the protection. Stand firm in the faith. That's leadership. Be strong. That's the protection and the leadership. Be a man. Be a man that's exemplary so the rest of the church can look at you and see this is how I'm supposed to be. And I want you to see this very clearly. This is so important. If you want and you can, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. I want to show you the concept very quickly of being strong and courageous. In every place in Scripture where men are told to man up, that's what I call, that's the Chris Hamilton translation of be strong and courageous. Man up. It's in the context of what the Lord is going to do. And in Deuteronomy 31, I'll start in verse 5. The Lord will deliver them up before you. This is Moses' last counsel. Okay, and God is describing what's going to happen. The Lord will deliver them up before you. He's going to win the battle is what he's saying. And you shall do to them according to all the commandments which I've commanded you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. I could stop there and tell you everything you need to know about this concept. If you look at those verses very closely, he's saying, don't be afraid, be strong and courageous, and it has nothing to do with what they're going to do. It has everything to do with what? What God's going to do. Think about that for a second. If God is saying, you're going to be fine, everything's going to be okay, now be strong and courageous, Doesn't, isn't there a cognitive dissonance there? Why, do I, why would I be afraid if God's going to take care of everything? Because that's who we are. We are weak. Then verse 7, then Moses called to Joshua, and real quick, Joshua is a warrior. Joshua um, was a man's man. The, the tactics that are described in Scripture that Joshua employed on the battlefield are still taught in military colleges to this day. Joshua was a man's man. And even with that, Moses called to Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, what? Don't wimp out. To Joshua, 
Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers and gave them, and you shall give it to them as an inheritance. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Again, that cognitive dissonance. God's going to take care of it all. Don't be afraid. And I look at that and I go, why in the world would he be afraid? Because that's who we are. That's why I call this the discipline of convictions. It's building into our, our sons the convictions of strength and courage. They will be afraid. They will wilt in the pressure of a wife someday who wants to assume the leadership. You're to train into them strength and courage. Deuteron- still in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 23 Then he commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, what? Again, be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the sons of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. But apparently, Joshua is still going to be afraid. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, Moses is gone. This is God's charge to Joshua now. This is God talking to Joshua No man will ever be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. Have you ever had a conversation with God where he says that to you? That must be awesome. That's the God of the universe telling Joshua, I got you. (laughs) I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. And then what does he say? One more time, be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to the left or to the right. You're probably familiar with that passage. It's all in the context of Moses and then God bucking up one of the most courageous men in the history of warfare and saying, be strong and courageous. If Joshua needs that, your son needs that. If Joshua needs that, you and I need that. It's the discipline of being strong and courageous of our convictions. Strength and courage do not come from physical prowess. It's based on spiritual maturity and faith. A strong and courageous man is a faithful man who's confident not in his skills, not in his abilities, but in the purposes of God. I am convinced that God has created me to be a provider, a leader, and a protector. Therefore, I will have the strength and courage of that conviction. I will do it no matter what the cost. Second Samuel chapter 10. I love this story. If you have boys, I highly recommend you tell them this story someday. This is what I'm talking about all rolled up into a story. Second Samuel chapter 10, verses 9 through 14. You can... Look it up later if you want. I'll read it to you. When Joab saw that the battle was set against him in the front and the rear, we're talking wartime, battle scene, battlefield. They are what? Where's the enemy? They're surrounded. When you're surrounded on a battlefield, what's going to happen? Bad things. You're probably going to die. It's not the strategic advantage you want. But they're surrounded. He selected from all the choice men of Israel and arrayed them against the Arameans. But the remainder of the people he placed in the hand of Abishai, his brother, and he arrayed them against the sons of Ammon. And he said, if the Arameans are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the sons of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will come to help you. In other words, they're going to line up back to back, and they're going to fight the people in front of them. And if They're being overtaken, we'll turn around and help you, and if we're being overtaken, you turn around and help us. You get the picture? This is fight to the death. This does not look good. Verse 12 of 2 Samuel 10, be strong, he says to them, right before the battle, be strong. Let us show ourselves courageous. Why? There's two reasons he gives. For the sake of our people and for the cities of our God. You be strong and courageous. You die with strength and courage for the sake of the people who are watching you. And you be strong and courageous for the cities of our God. In other words, to the glory of God. 
and may the Lord do what is good in his sight. That last part is so important. We teach our sons the discipline of the strength and courage of their convictions, and they worry about the results. God will take care of the results, but I'm going to do what I'm called to do. Can you imagine producing a little man like that? So Joab and the people, by the way, who were with him drew near to battle against the Arameans, and they fled before him. And when the sons of Ammon saw that the Arameans fled, they also fled. Then Joab returned from fighting against the sons of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. I just wanted to read that to you so you knew the rest of the story. It turned out okay. But it doesn't always turn out okay. So it's a, it's a great story to teach your sons. But don't miss the message of the story. It's strength and courage of their convictions. They do what's right, not because they're guaranteed anything other than they're called to do what's right. God will take care of the results. As your little guy grows into the roles and functions of a leader, provider, and protector, he should be strong and courageous. God will not fail him or forsake him. That's why he's strong and courageous. The Lord will be with him. That's why he's strong and courageous. The battle is the Lord's. That's why he's strong and courageous. He should do it for the sake of the people. What people? He should do it for the sake of his wife and for the sake of his children and anybody else who's watching him, what God's called you to do, the glory and the reputation of God. And why on all of this? Because he's doing exactly what God's called him to do. There are very few things in life when you can have the depth of that kind of conviction. But what we're talking about today, you certainly can. Number five, number five, humility. Fifth discipline is humility. I, this is really important following up on convictions because strength and grace combined in one person is the ultimate measure of a man. You all know someone probably who has, he's a man's man and he's humble and it's all in one person and hopefully that's your husband you're thinking of. <laughs> Maybe your dad, maybe somebody else you know. That's the ultimate measure of a man. Strength and courage mixed with pride is ungodly, and it's toxic. You get a man with strong convictions who's humble, that's godly. That's the picture. That's the discipline. You have a man with deep convictions who's proud and arrogant, is ugly. And it's normal, by the way. The leader, provider, protector is the man who devotes his life 24-7 to the humble service of others. We talked about this in the context of your daughters last night, and I told you we're coming to the guys. We're here. It's the same humility. Humility is not just a discipline for the ladies, it's a, and it's not just for the men. It's for all of us. 2 Timothy 2.1 is the verse that puts all this together. You therefore, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Strength, grace. Courage, grace. And the point is this. The grace reminds us that whatever we're boasting in, whatever we're convinced of, whatever we're strong and courageous about, it's not because we bring anything to the game. It's because we serve a great God. That's the discipline. 2 Timothy 2, 1 annihilates the cultural and popular view of strength, which is physical strength. I'm talking about for boys. If you can play football, man, you're a man. You're strong. That's not God's definition of strength and grace. Intellectual, emotional, self-sufficiency, none of that is what the Bible's talking about. True strength comes from Christ. It's undeserved, unmerited, unearned. And a recognition of your son of all of that. Biblical leadership is servant leadership. Humble servant leadership. 1 Peter 2.13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every institution. What that verse is really saying is don't just submit when the opportunity comes along. It's the discipline of looking for who can I submit to. That's biblical manhood. That is so contrary um, to our culture. 1 Peter 5, 5, 
uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, Younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility. You know, our, our sons run around trying to figure out what they're going to wear to school every day. Don't forget to tell them, clothe yourself in humility. Probably don't want to do that on a Monday morning when, in the heat of the battle, but the point is this. They should be as concerned with the humility that they're wrapping themselves in as much as the clothing that they're wrapping themselves in. Micah 6, 8, I've always loved this verse. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Doing justice, that's the convictions, that's the strength and courage. Do justice. Love kindness and walk humbly, there's the humility. And you all know, as I'm describing this, man, you know men who have this, the strength of their convictions and humility, and it's just a beautiful thing to see. It's such a manly thing to see. That didn't just happen. Somebody trained them. Somebody taught them. And sometimes it's the hard knocks of life. Number six, the sixth discipline. I call this the discipline of being a one-woman man, a one-woman man. A biblical man, your little man, will understand that other than very rare circumstances, he's called to love, to lead, to protect, and to provide for one woman in his life. And it's not his mother, by the way. He should be prepared for that. And this truth, this reality, this fact of life should be the guide in all of his interaction and relationship with the opposite sex. You know 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. That phrase, honor. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. That's scary language. Just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects us is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. You cannot state a, an issue in more serious terms than that right there. Your son, in every way, coming out of your home, should understand that he is a one woman man. Can you imagine how our culture would be different if parents were teaching their sons that they were, are called to be by their creator's design to love one woman? There's entire industries that would be wiped out. This is God's will for his life, sanctification and honor. That honor speaks of chivalry and exclusivity. So, work, money, purpose, convictions, humility, a one-woman man. Those are some suggestions for you to prepare your son to be equipped, to be ready for the day he leaves your home to go be a husband and a father, to be a biblical man, to be a provider, a leader, and a protector. He's disciplined in his view of money. He's disciplined in his work ethic and understanding the purpose of work. He's disciplined in, in understanding his purpose and confining his life and driving his life by the understanding of who and what he is. He understands and has convictions about who and what he is, which is moderated then by humility, and he's a one-woman man. And like I said, there's a bunch more we could go through. That'll, that'll cover it for this morning. So let me take a, a few more minutes and go back through those. And this is where we cross the line to methodology ideas, things to think about. And none of this is thus saith the Lord. This is based on observation. Um, Ann and I have been involved in youth ministry. We've been married 31 years and probably uh, over 20 of those years probably over 25 of those years we've been involved in youth ministry. 
whether it's junior high, high school, and currently in a college ministry with about 700 college students in it. I see a lot. Um, and some of this is bouncing off of observations. The discipline of work. Work begins now, and I say that with great confidence that most of your sons are three or four years old and older. You can begin to teach work now. Um, giving them things to do in the home. Giving them purpose in the home. Working around the, ho- the house. I say this in Southern California. I have no idea if this has um, any relevance in Texas, but I tell um, room, rooms full of parents at Grace Church, fire the gardener. You have a son. Why are you paying a gardener to do your yard? Give them that work to do. Is he going to run over sprinklers with the lawnmower? Yes. <laughs> Let him fix the sprinklers. Let him figure it out. I know, you get rain here. Yeah, flying in yesterday, it was beautiful how green it was. And someone reminded me, well, that's because you're from California. It looks green to you. You want to teach that work is a gift from God. That's a discipline and that's a perspective. And how do you do that? Men, you should find pleasure in your work. Even raising daughters, this was always convicting to me. It's so easy to come home where I live at the end of the day and grouse about traffic grouse about the job, talk about how I'd rather be at home um, with my girls. God's design for man is work. Therefore, God's will for man is work. We need to teach that connection and take joy in that. And dads, we need to pursue excellence in our work. And we need to talk about that. We need to be careful about always complaining about work. If work is always a drudgery, your kids will learn that work is a drudgery. And that's completely opposite of what you really want to teach your children, which is it's Genesis 2, it's pre-fall, it's a gift. It's what God designed me for, so why am I complaining about it all the time? Your actions speak louder than words in this regard. The fact that you get up early in the morning and go to work every day and come home is not enough to Train your sons the proper perspective on work. Yes, they'll catch some of that. Man, dad was a hard worker. I want to be a hard worker. Nothing wrong with that. What we're talking about is the next level of giving the purpose and the explanation behind that. You want to talk to your children about the realities of work, and you want to communicate, communicate, communicate in this area, and it's not just your sons, it's your daughters. Your daughters, hopefully, are going to marry a biblical man someday who's going to provide for them And to have your daughter understand and honor the work that her husband does someday. And moms, you should express appreciation for the hard work of your husband when you can and as you can. One other thing. Don't train your son into your son the attitude that mom is the maid. That mom works for him. Mom is a servant. As God defines a servant out of love for him and out of um, obedience to her role. She serves your son, but she is not his maid. And guys, you and I need to lead our sons and even lead our wives in not establishing that role. And this comes from my experience. We used to take kids to camp. We still do. I don't go anymore. It'd be creepy for a 56-year-old to go to camp with the high schoolers. Um, but we used to jump on the bus and drive to New Mexico every year and it, go, be a camp counselor. So I'm in the cabin with the boys, and I see the moms who pack everything for their boys. And they put a list in there, and they say, wear this on Monday morning, wear this on Monday afternoon, call me. Um, uh, unbelievable. And that's a situation where mom, she loves her son. I'm not questioning that, but she's training him into a view of women that is not good. She's not his maid. And by the way, if you, if you train your son out of that kind of thinking, um, his wife will rise up and bless you someday. Discipline of money, uh, specifically giving and contentment. Giving establishes the proper priorities of money. And discipline giving puts money in its proper perspective, and it demonstrates contentment. 
and it requires planning. There is nothing I just said to you that is bad. It's all good. And so if you want to train in priorities and perspective and contentment and planning, start training your sons by giving them the opportunity to give away money that they've earned to the church or to somebody else. Contentment. Contentment, training into our sons that contentment comes from a right relationship with God, not with how much is in the bank. Everything we have is loaned to us. And remind them of the physical contentment threshold, food and clothing. You want to teach your sons, train your sons to flee from the love of money. Money's not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and it's a snare. Model it, talk about it, make contentment part of his vocabulary. Talk about the the tension, even in your own life, men, between contentment and ambition. Have you ever done a word study? Does the Bible ever say to be ambitious? Yes, it does. What does it say to be ambitious about? And how does that line up with what the Bible says about being content? And just to kind of give you the bottom line, you will always find in Scripture you are to be content in your circumstances. You are to never be content in your spiritual condition. Your ambition is to be like Christ. Your contentment is in your circumstances. That's a whole other session. Purpose. And I want to caution here, when, when I start talking about how you train your sons in purpose, this is, I'm not promoting a no-fun-allowed life a smileless life, a dead, serious as a heart attack life or view of life. This is about putting fun in its proper place and priority after everything else is done. Uh, this clearly doesn't apply to this group because of what day it is and where we are, but, but parents who are wrapped up in amusement every weekend shouldn't be surprised when their sons don't understand the biblical priorities of work and church and, and the proper place of it. Time management is not just a secular concept, it's biblical. If your son wastes time, he may be imitating somebody. Yeah, sorry, ouch. A person who wastes time doesn't appreciate, appreciate the scarcity of it in the same way that somebody who wastes money doesn't appreciate the scarcity of money. Time is precious. And a young man who doesn't understand the scarcity of time doesn't have enough to do. That doesn't mean you give them more video games to play. Give them work. Give them things to do. There's all kinds of time wasters. There's video games, television, sports, academics. Did I just say that? I just said that. Academics. There's, I know young men in college with no clue, no clue on why or what he's doing and what he's going to do when he gets out. He just knows he's supposed to get A's. And the idea here is to teach purposeful living, purposeful thinking. Why am I here? Why am I devoting time to this pursuit? You should produce from your home a young man who you can ask him, why are you going for a run this afternoon? And he can answer the question, with purpose. And this starts early. Why do I have to go to school? Your kids ever asked you that? Don't answer because I told you so. Why do I have to go to school is a golden opportunity to teach. Why do I have to get a job? Golden opportunity to go through what we've talked about this morning. Why do I have to do homework? I don't want to do homework. Why do you make me do homework? Why do I have to mow the lawn? Why do I have to empty the trash? Why do I have to clean up after the dog? Why do I have to go to church? Why questions drive us crazy sometimes, don't they? Just don't forget they are gold. They are fertile ground for answering those why questions. They shouldn't be a flashpoint of anger on our part. They're a golden opportunity to teach, train, and develop. And by the way, until you can answer those questions, how do you expect your son to answer those questions? 
Number four, convictions. You need to teach your son to have convictions and base those convictions on the truth and wisdom of God's Word and to live according to those convictions. There's a lot of people walking around with convictions that don't live their own convictions. Teach your son to communicate his convictions. In, in youth ministry at my church, we call it um, male communication is this, dude, like, and um. You know what I'm talking about? Dude, like, um... That's the extent of communication you get from the average teenage boy. You have the opportunity to be the exception. The boy coming out of your home should know how to communicate, articulate thoughts, make eye contact. That is how you communicate convictions. You're training him so that when he has convictions and he's a leader in his own home, he can communicate. You want to teach the value of appearances. Remember the story from 2 Samuel 10, for the sake of the people and for the cities of our God. This is the essence of leadership, others following you. Men in this room, people are following you. You think you're not a leader? You are a leader. You want to lead from the front, not the back. And by the way, teaching the value of appearances is not teaching them to be Pharisees. There is a consistency between the convictions and their private life and what other people see but there is an accountability of appearances. You should stop protecting your little boy. You should allow his strength and courage to be tested. Allow his character and convictions to become his own. Incubators do not produce strong and courageous men. And I've already kind of talked about this. You want to stop doing everything for him. And and parenting out of fear stunts the growth of your son's strength and courage. And when I say parenting out of fear, there's a whole lot we can say here. Um, But not allowing your son to fail is very, very dangerous. Your lack of practical faith in the sovereignty of God will be replicated in the adult life of your son. Especially if your son has given his life to Christ, he's been given everything He's been given everything you've been given. Let him do it. As he grows into the roles of a leader, protector, and provider, you want to expect him to gain in strength and courage, not because of his skill, but because, remember, God will not fail him. God will be with him. The battle is the Lord's. And why does he have that strength and courage? Because he's doing exactly what God's called him to do. That's the source of his conviction. Humility, the distinguishing difference between a wise man and a fool. Do you know what that is? In Proverbs 1, it lays it out. The distinguishing difference between a wise man and a fool is that a wise man seeks a rebuke and a fool runs from it, rejects it, doesn't look for it. It takes enormous humility for a young man to seek the rebuke. When your son comes to you and says, what do you think about what I just did? Wow, you've done good. Because in some sense, he's seeking the rebuke. Teach your son to look for opportunity to submit. A humble and a happy man is never free from accountability. So many men have wildly generous views of themselves. And often this comes from a home where he was spoiled, catered to, deferred to, pampered, and protected. Let him fail. Stop training him by your parenting that he cannot and never will fail. I've had young men like this work for me. And the first time things go bad, they completely fall apart. And you realize this kid never realized he's not going to win every time. Without the risk of failure, there's no motivation for success. And that is something that can be taught in your home. And a one-woman man, number six, in his role in life as a one-woman man, directing how he views and interacts with music, movies, the internet, books, video games, young ladies, it's all affected. And I know dating is is a ways off for you guys, but I think it's good for you to start thinking about this and even maybe start having, depending on how old your son or sons are, and even your daughters, you need to start this conversation early. 
I started talking about dating when my daughters were six, seven, eight years old, and they thought I was crazy, and that's okay. I was building into them an understanding, an understanding, an understanding, and then all of a sudden, when the hormones flip and boys don't have cooties anymore, they already understood what the rules of the game were going to be. When is a young man ready to date? Probably when he's ready to be married. When is a young man ready to be married? Probably when he has demonstra a demonstrated pattern in your home of knowing, understanding, and pursuing the roles of being a provider, a leader, and a protector. Not in perfection, not in completeness, but he gets it and he's on that trajectory. Dating before this point in life is difficult to do without violating the admonition towards honorable dealing with women and being a one-woman man. In our high school group back at my church, we call dating divorce training. Because what happens is everyone pairs up, goes out on dates, and then what do they do? They break up, and then they're on to the next one. And they break up, and they're on to the next one, and they break up and they get married someday, things don't go real well, and what are they accustomed to doing? Breaking up. I'm not saying dating is evil, dating is wrong, but I am saying that unsupervised, untrained dating is dangerous. You're training a, a, a mindset. The other thing I see with young men is they're so caught up in the swooning of, of, a, of a relationship with the opposite sex, they get addicted to that feeling. That this woman, this girl is, thinks I'm great until she doesn't. And then I break up with her and I go look for that, um, that feeling again. So I encourage young men, I encourage you to think about whether you should focus them on developing friends, friendships with other males rather than females. Because by definition, once they get married, all their close female friends drop away, don't they? sure hope so. What's going to carry them through life is the relationship um, with other men. Teach them chivalry. Teach them how to treat a woman. By example, how do you treat your wife? Let him practice on his mom and on his sisters. The, the care and the uh, um, chivalry of a male towards women. Okay? So, it's a lot. I know I turned the fire hose on you again this morning. I hope that's helpful in this, in this sense. I hope there's great clarity in what the Bible says you're trying to produce from your home. And I hope that, that the discussion of disciplines helps you think through what you want to talk through as a couple, and then the methodology is purely just to stir it up even more for you guys to think about how are we going to get here. So we left a few minutes for questions. You want them to do it now? Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Well, cl oh. Uh, my struggle is I'm around five to five almost every day, except about an evening or two in the day. Maybe it's just more than I guess I guess my time gets spent with father and my son. Um, that still fits for you that you're gone in the evening and you're, you're working the full day. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I'll repeat it because this is being recorded, right? You need, okay. So the question is, you're, you're gone from five to five doing the uh, provision thing, and that leaves very few hours to do everything else uh, when you get home, um, being a husband and a father, and you wanted practical advice on how to handle it. First of all, you're doing exactly what God's called you to do, and you should be encouraged in that. The second thing is um, you should be prepared when you get home that uh, and and I, this is really hard to do, and I still remember these days. When you get home, it's not time to let down. You don't get to sit down and pick up the paper or pick up the remote and relax. Dads, when you get home, it's time to step it up to a whole new level. 
I, this may not be encouraging to you, but this is real. Your wife needs you. Your children want you. Um, and you do have a job to do. So I, I, my encouragement to you, and, and I, I used to have a long commute. I used to get up as early as I needed to so that I could get home at a certain time. I had the type of job and career that I could dictate that a little bit. Um, I've always said it takes more discipline to get out of the office than it takes to get into the office. So I would get up as early as I needed to to get the work done so that I could be home at a certain time because my wife was very clear with me she needed me home by a certain time. And I would take those kids so that she could make dinner or whatever free of three little kids climbing all over her. Um, and, and I used to sit in the, uh, at the stoplight coming home and go, I am so tired. It's been such a whatever kind of day, but I need to put on my A game right now. And I think it's a matter of prayer as you go home. Um, and when you get home, it's game on. And if the Lord's given you from 5 to 7.30 every night or whatever time your kids go to bed, own it. And I wouldn't um, um, be discouraged that you only have that time, but be encouraged that you get that time. And then Saturdays for me was uh, nothing came between me and family time on Saturdays, with some exception. Um, and then, of course, church is, is the center of everything. So I can keep going, but is that helpful? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Great question. Oldest uh, child is bossy, and a uh, very astute question on how do you address that issue so that she doesn't learn um, that that's a way of life. And um, this is a, a I, I could tell you stories of how we dealt with it, bad and good. We were not perfect parents. But at the end of the day, I'll tell you what I learned is there's some issues that you direct head on, and there's a other issues that you look at what's the basic fundamental issue going on here and deal with that so when you have a bossy child yeah there's a bossy child and yes my oldest did it and the other two would stand here and tell you she did it it was very prominent but what it demonstrated wasn't just a bossiness but there's a pride there's an arrogance and so it's really hard to deal with the bossy issue especially when it's kind of helpful to mom right so it's really easy sometimes to let the bossy one be bossy because she's making your life easier. You know it's not a good issue or not a good place to be. What you do is you understand that we're really dealing with a pride, maybe even an arrogance. And so in, in our family situation, what we did is we started looking for something to put our daughter into that she would fail at. In other words, learn some humility. And it wasn't because we took some purient interest in watching our daughter suffer. Um, it was we needed her to understand that she's not all that, that there is a place for humility. And so you look for what's the spiritual issue going on here and address that maybe a different way. And when you deal with it this way, the bossy issue took care of itself. Okay? So, and I tell you, I'm just answering your question. That's how we addressed it. Your, every family's different. Um, there was an issue where one of my daughters was physically bossy. She would shove the little one and I saw her do it once and then we had tried everything else so there's one day this is being recorded I might get in trouble for this but I went up to her and I did exactly to her what she just did to her little sister physical shocked her it ended it um, should you do that I don't know we tried everything else and then it, I even talked to Ann. I said, this is what I'm going to do. She needs to feel what it's like to have a big person physically do that to her. And it worked. So that's one thing on the bossy side. 
depending on if it's getting physical, and that tends to be with a boy shoving um, his sisters around or, or whatever. Okay, yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, your answer is in your question. I'm going to um, um, say this. You love your work today because you found what you love to do but your parents instilled in you a discipline of work. You had to pick up the poop, you said, and you hated it, but you did it anyway, right? And so they instilled in you the concept of work, of, of physical labor, and then when you found something you loved to do, you already had the work ethic, and the fact is you wouldn't have met the success you have met with if you didn't have the ethic of work. But your question is really good. How? do you find work that they love to do? The idea is not just to give um, your, your sons work that they love to do. Um, very few of us are in careers. I, I'm a forensic accountant. I work a lot with lawyers. I'm in court all the time. I'm, I'm in trial on Tuesday. Um, I love what I do. I do uh, uh, very dynamic, interesting work. I, I could win the lottery. To, I'd have to play the lottery to win. I don't. But I could win the lottery tomorrow, and I would go to work on Monday. I love my work. That is a gift from the Lord. Not everyone gets to do that. And the practical reality is your son may or may not find work that he loves to do. He may find a job that he gets a paycheck for that allows him to marry the love of his life someday, and all of a sudden he's in a career. Um, so it, it's the, the love of work is not in the content of their work. It's in the fact that they get to work, that they get to bring home a paycheck. There's a lot of people in this country that couldn't work if they wanted to. Um, there's um, people who are injured or sick who would give anything for the opportunity to leave their home, leave their hospital bed, leave whatever the situation is and, and go to work. And that's what the love of work is. Um, if, if I react um, strongly to our culture that says you must you must do what you love, and if you don't love what you do, leave it and go find something you love. That speaks to a flighty, unstable perspective on life. Um, and I, I w I'll also say this. I think if you love work because it's a blessing from the Lord and it's an avenue to provide for your home, that's enough motivation for work. You can put up with a whole lot. So I think that's what you build into your son. And then you pray. Lord, give him the work he loves to do, because that is such a blessing in life. I love going to work. Um, I realize not everybody does. We all sit on the 405 freeway, and I see the people around me. They don't love what they're doing. <laughs> if you've been to Southern California, you know what I'm talking about. It's like Maynard Baptist. Maynard? Okay. All right. Um, well, I wanted to give you guys some impressive